Please welcome to the stage CBI President John Allen. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all for, uh, for attending, and welcome to the CBI's annual conference 2018. And what a time it is for us to come together at a moment when the future of our country is being fought over, hour by hour, bulletin by bulletin, tweet by tweet. Today, we won't need to be glued to our phones to find out what's going on, because we're in the room in this room, 1,500 of the country's leading business people, and we'll be joined by the Prime Minister later, and later still by the Leader of the Opposition, each ready to share their competing visions for our country. In a minute, I'll talk about the Prime Minister's Brexit deal, but first let's take a step back, because I want to say something to you, our members. I want to say thank you. Thank you for all that you've enabled us to achieve since we last met in this room a year ago, is because of our collective influence that the past year has seen the biggest increase in government-sponsored R&D spending for 40 years, a step towards, but a significant step towards, the CBI's 3% target. Approval for the expansion of Heathrow, a decision for business that will benefit our whole country. A new government export strategy based squarely on the CBI's recommendations far-reaching and much-needed reform to the apprenticeship levy, and frankly, more to come, and a major reform to the tax regime governing business investment. But perhaps the biggest change of all isn't found in white papers, budget speeches, or primary legislation. It's something even more important. It's the change in the relationship the government has with business. At the Conservative Party conference this year, we heard both the Prime Minister and the Chancellor give two of the most pro-enterprise speeches politics has produced in years. And they were backed up by action. In the past few weeks alone, the Prime Minister has formed five new business councils on which the CBI is very well represented, appointed William Vereker as her dedicated business envoy, and has repeatedly sat down with CBI members to hear what you have to say. But now I'd like to talk for a couple of minutes about Brexit and about that Brexit deal. It's not perfect, we all know that, but we're trying to reach a deal that respects the results of the referendum and minimizes the damage to our economy. And I know how hard it's been to get to that point. In the five months I've been president of the CBI, the team and I have met with ambassadors, MPs, MEPs, heads of state, national leaders, including the Taoiseach in Dublin, and we have, I think, found that they're all wrestling with the conundrum of what to do about, about Brexit. We also met Michel Barnier and his team. Every single one of them has had to compromise in reaching this deal. And companies in this room would be the first to say that it's not perfect, but it opens a route to a long-term trade arrangement. It unlocks the transition period, the very least that companies need to prepare for Brexit. Yet more important even than either of those is that it avoids the nightmare scenario of a no-deal departure, which would be a wrecking ball for our economy. In just four months, just a little over, we'll be out of the EU. If we're out without a deal, it will have severe consequences in every part of our country. Oxford Economics has said that in the short term, by 2020, our GDP would be lower than it might otherwise have been by 2%. And in the longer term, by up to 8%, according to the IMF. And that means potential jobs lost and potentially lower wages. Do we want another decade of no increase in real wages for our colleagues who work in the, the economy? Do we actually want to remain at the bottom of the league table for growth rather than getting back to a position that we should be able to achieve much closer to the top? And this turmoil is damaging our country now. In the past few days alone, we've, we have heard 
for example, from a life sciences firm in the Northwest that has cut almost all investment in the UK, diverting it instead to Germany and China, a Northern Irish tech firm that has stopped winning contracts because their aerospace customers are worried about Brexit, and a construction firm that says it now costs an extra £20,000 to build a house because of a shortage of materials and labour since the Brexit vote. These stories are repeated many times across the country. 80% of firms have already cut or postponed investment because of the risk of a no-deal exit. So our message to the politicians is this. Listen to the businesses in your constituencies, talk to them, hear what they have to say, and talk to everyone who depends on them. But now let's look to the future, because that's what really matters. And that's why the theme we've chosen today is the next generation. And I'm pleased that not only will we be hearing from both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, we'll also be hearing from the CBI's Director General, Carolyn Fairburn, who give her perspective on the future of business, informed by her conversations with many CBI members. And of course, we'll be hearing from the usual fantastic selection of business leaders, Liv Garfield from Seven Trent, Joshua Graf from LinkedIn, and many, many others. But finally, I'm especially pleased we'll also be hearing from the next generation themselves, young people who've worked with us to share their views on business, their careers, and the future, and who have provided several short video clips which we'll show throughout the day. And of course, none of this would be possible without today's main sponsors, Accenture and Hayes, who've helped us put on our biggest conference in years. Now, in conclusion, the British Nobel Prize winning physicist and businessman, Dennis Gabor, once said, we cannot know the future, but we can invent it. And among the political heat and flying sparks, there is one thing of which I'm certain, that the people in this room, the people who build our roads and railways, who provide life-saving medicines, who keep our financial system working, who keep our high streets stocked, who innovate to bring us new technology, you and your colleagues are the people ready and willing to invent the future. And together, that's what we can and will do. Thank you. Now I have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Carolyn Fairburn, our CBI Director General, and the BBC Deputy Political Editor, John Pienaar. We'll hear from Carolyn on how business and government must work together to deliver for our country, and then John Pienaar will interview Carolyn in our first session of the day, Prosperity Shared. So please join me in welcoming Carolyn and John to the stage. John. A long walk. Long walk. Well, good morning, everyone. It is absolutely wonderful to welcome so many of you here today at what is an extraordinary moment for our country. Now, John has already talked about the events of last week and Brexit, and you'll be pleased to hear I'm not going to cover all of that same ground again. But I do just want to reinforce one important point. Brexit is consuming government, every politician, every civil servant, and it is also consuming British business. Our firms are spending hundreds of millions of pounds preparing for the worst case, and not one penny of it will create good new jobs or new products. Investment is flooding out of the right areas like skills and technology and into areas that do absolutely nothing to help our productivity, and some of it is leaving our country altogether. So while other countries are forging a competitive future, our nerve centre here, Westminster, seems to be living in its own narrow world. It seems to be playing a high-stakes game of risk where the outcome could be an accidental no deal. Surely, surely, we can do better than this. The agreement, as John has said, it's not perfect. It is a compromise, but it is hard-won progress. And I've heard all last week from literally hundreds of firms, 
This is not a time to go backwards. It's not a time to go backwards because there are so many other challenges we need to respond to. The robotics revolution, the rise of China, climate change, intolerance of inequality, global protectionism. These are the forces that will truly shape our future. And I am really delighted we are joined by so many young people here today. You are a generation who knows what you believe in and you're prepared to stand up for it. We want to hear from you. Please carry on speaking up. Now, there is some talk of your generation being worse off than the one before you. Well, today is all about how we as a country make sure that just does not happen. And I do believe that many of the answers to that challenge, li challenge lie right here with us, with business, many of you in the room today. And that's what I'd like to talk about this morning, a UK beyond Brexit. Now, the challenges are, of course, very real. In 2007, we had the biggest crash since the 1920s. Too few people have seen their living standards rise, and too many feel a sharp-edged sense of unfairness, that too much of the benefits of markets have been concentrated at the top and in some parts of the country. And while technology does hold huge promise, and I'm a real optimist about what technology can bring, it is also fueling our knees as people wonder what it will mean for their working lives. Yes, there have been changes to celebrate, but there's no question. These are uncharted waters, and no one has all the answers. And here, and here we do have a problem. In a world of great uncertainty, ide ideology can too often rush in to fill the void. And we have seen it. We've seen it. And it's not just in the Brexit debate. Radical ideas are being put forward, and some do offer genuine solutions but others risk harming the very people who place their hope in them. Now, we all agree new ideas are needed, and there are so many on display here. I hope you get the chance to see them. But if any idea is to succeed, it must be done with business and not done to business. Now, I say this with humility. Business gets things wrong. Sometimes it gets them badly wrong. And I certainly don't claim that business has all the answers we need. But we do have many that are proven and powerful, and they are working today. Because of business, employment in this country is at a record high, 27 million and counting. Four-fifths of all UK tax revenue enabled by private enterprise. And business has been more resilient than anyone could have imagined during this period of seismic uncertainty protecting livelihoods across the country. And business has proven itself time and time again to be an extraordinary force for lasting and positive change. And there's more than this. We have a pretty clear idea of how this force needs to be used. We hear it all the time, and especially from our younger business leaders and our under 35 group. Many of them are here today, and you are hugely welcome. Across business and politics, there is real agreement on the kind of country we want to build. Now, the Conservatives call it a country that works for everyone. Labour call it for the many, not the few. At the CBI, we call it prosperity shared. We have a common goal, to build an economy of high productivity jobs across the whole country. An economy built on science, innovation, rule of law, services, and dare I say it, predictability. We can and will, I believe, get back to that that renews our infrastructure and doubles our innovation spend, that creates opportunities for everyone in the next generation, where every young person has the training and skills to succeed, regardless of background or birthplace. In short, business and politics agree. We want the UK to be prosperous and fair. Where there is rather less agreement is on the how, on the policy ideas to get there. And here we need a much better conversation. We do have a pretty good sense of where not to look. The answer is not to resurrect old, failed ideologies from the past. Our message to those advocating renationalization is come and talk to business about the problems you want to fix. We all want better public services. Let's discuss how we can build the best possible rail, water, and energy services for consumers. 
And we would argue it does need to be a mixed economy because neither business nor government can do it on their own. And we should remember that when nationalization was last tried in the 1970s, it ushered in one of the darkest periods in our country's modern economic history. Let's not return there. On the other hand, extreme market ideology does not get us much further. Becoming a hustling cowboy nation with minimal regulation is not what people want, and it's not what business wants either. But there is one further answer that's not good enough, and that's the status quo. It was Winston Churchill who a century ago said the maximum of the British people is business as usual. And that was the right motto for then, but it's not the right one for today. Choose one for our times, and it might be something like disrupt or be disrupted. And it does apply to business. CBI members have been clear, business must change too. And now, more than ever, we need to demonstrate that business is about so much more than making money. We know this to be true, whether it's banking or brewing, business is about creating jobs, services, products, ideas, opportunities, about making a difference. That is the true purpose of business. And now is the moment we must rekindle that sense of purpose, not just in what our companies do, but in how business itself is perceived. So what needs to happen next? Well, the greatest achievements in our society have come when business and government have worked not in opposition, but in partnership. The way our privatized energy sector, working with government, has cut emissions by almost 60% since 1990, or look a little bit further back to Harold Macmillan's house building program, 300,000 homes a year built by, by private companies. And what these examples have in common is this. They're business and government together, and often alongside others too, union, unions, universities, many others on the, same, on the same journey. And we need, we urgently need, that spirit of collaboration back today. Because too much of what's happening now is characterized by enterprise and government acting apart. So what if instead we decided to build something different? In business, we might call it a joint venture. Others might call it something else. The name is far less important than what it could do. And let me just give you one example of what it could do in the area that matters most to business, and that is people. If we built a joint venture on skills, we could create hard-edged commitments on both sides. As the government evolves the apprenticeship levy into a broader skills levy, business can respond in kind and ensure that every penny of the £45 billion they currently spend on training goes into getting the UK ready for a new digital age. This would transform the UK's competitiveness and at the same time answer that false challenge that business would rather recruit low-paid workers than invest in skills. And we can extend this thinking to immigration policy. Now, the government is about to do something it has not done for 40 years, and that is to set the UK's own independent immigration policy. It's an opportunity, there's no doubt. But it's also a great responsibility. And what has been proposed so far won't work for our economy. The idea that anyone earning less than £30,000 can't contribute to our economy, for instance. Together, we could do so much better through a jointly developed immigration policy, one that avoids false choices, that does away with arbitrary targets, and that focuses instead on the people we need to build our economy. So in conclusion, the turbulence of our times is a challenge, and nothing I've talked about today can be achieved without a good Brexit outcome. But if we can secure this, and the days and weeks ahead will tell us whether we can, then we have a very real chance to turn challenge into opportunity. We can use this as a moment for new possibilities and new solutions to old problems, but it must be about getting beyond the divisions and working together. Employer and employee unions and investors, universities and industry, business and government. So my question to the Prime Minister and to the leader of the opposition when they join us later today is this. Business is ready for a new partnership. We will step up to the change that's needed. We share your goals. We have the ideas. We have the solutions to achieve them. Will you join us? 
And if so, together we can deliver prosperity shared. Thank you.